My name is Jamie Lathan, and I'm the Dean of Distance Education and Extended Programs at NCSSM. NCSSM, the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, is located in Durham, North Carolina, and is the nation's first public residential high school focused on science, technology, engineering, and math. Through a residential campus, online programs, distance education courses, and summer STEM enrichment programs, we challenge and inspire talented students. Part of our mission is to, quote, cultivate engaged citizens who will work for the betterment of the world, end quote. The Ethics and Leadership Conference aligns squarely with that mission. This year, the theme of the conference is artificial intelligence. And we are so grateful for the sponsorship of the RIDEEN Program for Innovation and Leadership in Artificial Intelligence and AI for Teachers. We are also thankful for the continued support of the Broyhill Family Foundation. A special thank you for our amazing keynote speakers, Dr. Igor Jablokov for the morning keynote and Dr. Phaedra Bonaderas for the afternoon keynote. And thank you to all of our session leaders and presenters. Another quick thank you to the other members of the Ethics and Leadership Planning Committee, my colleagues, Ms. Candace Chambers, Ms. Kendall Hagman Mays, Ms. Charlotte Dungan, and Ms. Key Benton. As a reminder, both keynotes will be recorded and shared out after the conference. If you need anything during the conference, please email us at elc at ncssm. Edu. Thank you again and welcome. I will now turn it over to Dr. Jablokov. So I'm coming to you from a wicked forest because, like the Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors, uh, this has to be Halloween themed. <laughs> um, so here I am, and here is our presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, um, uh, especially those of you that, that are night owls uh, like me. So we're going to be a little bit more fun um, because I, I'm sure we're as thrilled to do this in the morning as Wednesday Adams was uh, uh, to go to Camp uh, Chippewa. Um, <laughs> so we're going to have some fun with this. So most people that that uh, you know uh, you know talk about their lives and the products that they created and, and their life's work and and what have you they talk about all of these perfect moments uh, as as they create these things, and um, I'm going to mix it up a, a bit. Uh, there's a Japanese art form known as kintsugi, and it basically is is showing an art form, but also showing all the cracks and all the breaks and things like that. And they actually fill it in with gold in order to make it more compelling in order to show you how difficult it was to repair or create uh, that object. And so in that spirit, I'm going to be sharing uh, some things that you probably never heard of uh, about some of this uh, work, but I'll start with a little bit of, of uh, a backgrounder. Um, so I tell my family members, I think I was born in a cave. Um, so I, I was born in, in porous Greece. I think it was in a hospital, but then they moved me over to the cave. So it was civilized. Um, and so on the left is an actual photograph of a place I grew up. And on the right is, uh, is uh, my mother's uh, watercolor of this, uh, of this place. My parents were both artists. So from the outset, I started in a very creative uh, environment. And then if you actually look right outside the cave, what do you see? Water. And so I was always inspired seeing these dolphins, uh, you know, swimming up to uh, my literal home, right? So that was, uh, you know, pretty special. Some of you may have, you know, pet cats and dogs and, and things of that sort. You know, it's pretty cool to have a pet dolphin uh, show up once in a while. Uh, and on the left here is, uh, is a book uh, that one of my cousins wrote. It's a science fiction book. Um, funny enough, you know, when I would see these, um, uh, these creatures, I started thinking, what if I could talk to them? That'd be pretty cool. 
you know, what if I would talk to them? And so I tucked that in the back of my mind as a, as a five-year-old. Um, and we eventually ended up moving uh, to the US. So imagine it's like this in the morning. I'm living in this uh, white former uh, um, um, farmhouse in Philadelphia. The next thing you know, I'm startled awake. I don't speak English, I'm just startled awake. It sounds like a big, um, a big bang, a big boom. And it's because across the street, it, there just happened to be a re revolutionary war battleground and they do a recreation once a year and the red coats and the blue coats were firing cannons and muskets and things like that. And out of coming out of a serene environment with dolphins, you know, uh, you know, being playful right outside my door, as you can tell, this was a pretty jarring experience uh, to come to the US and, and now feel like you're in the middle of a, uh, a war zone here. And so uh, I was in Philadelphia because my grandparents uh, lived there and, and that's where we lived for a spell. And I was inspired by my grandfather as well. He was a watchmaker. You know, when they you know, came over to the US from Germany, um, he would tinker and repair watches uh, for a living. And, and really, when you think about um, you know, STEM, when you think about the sciences, when you think about engineering, for the most part, it is a lot of this tinkering and experimentation. And so it's not hard for us to see these patterns when, when we go into the real uh, world. Now, another thing happened. And so I was in this um, you know, tiny uh, Catholic school in, in Philadelphia. And once a month, the nuns would walk past my desk and they would look down at my chair and they would see these little dimes taped uh, to it once a month. And so second month, they would walk past my chair, plastic chair, probably like you sit on, and they would see more dimes taped to the bottom of the chair. A third month, they would see more dimes, uh, you know, taped to the bottom of the chair. They finally asked me, Igor, why are there dimes taped to the bottom of your chair every month? And I said, look, you know, a lot of some of us want to tinker with science and have science experiments and things like that, but you don't have enough equipment around here. And so I decided to ask my fellow students um, to for all of us to collect our allowances, the money that we had uh, once a month, and we would use that money in order to buy some neat little thing in order to run some neat little uh, experiment. Now, why is this important? And why is this? Um, why am I telling you this story under the auspices of a lemonade stand? Because uh, a friend of mine who was an Eisenhower fellow wrote this book, Steve Welch, called We Are All Born Entrepreneurs. If you did anything, Girl Scouts cookies, lemonade stands, you know, you know, you know, garage sales, things like that. If you figured out that you can do a piece of work and sell it somehow um, that, or, or collect all of these uh, uh, things, some, uh, you're more likely to be uh, fundable by venture capitalists far later uh, in your lives, because under the age of 12, you started figuring out how some of this stuff works, right, in, in economies and stuff like that. So that's what was funny uh, about that story. And, and certainly around the same time, I was getting inspired by some of the first, um, um, you know, folks that were essentially bringing computing to uh, the masses, so to speak, so that I could um, start um, uh, learning um, how to use this type of equipment. Of course, you know, you know, our parents you know, made us go to dance stuff and take art lessons and violin lessons, piano lessons, and, and um, you know, how to paint and things like that. And then also uh, computers were something that were part of our lives. Um, this is actually very similar to the first computer that I had. I know it looks very clunky by your standards. And that tape drive, I have to say, would always eat my basic programs. You know, this was, you know, uh, I had a a very antagonistic relationship with that tape drive because I would put it in there, I would type in my little commands to save my basic programs on it, and it literally was like a monster eating my programs. I could never get it to read uh, back out, and I don't know what I was uh, doing uh, doing wrong, um, but that was my first computer ever. Now, my mother ended up moving us uh, to Montreal, uh, so it's a similar story to Kamala Harris. You may have heard that her mother moved her to uh, Montreal as well. And until years later, my mother didn't admit that she had a choice between taking us to, uh, to a French school or an English school, she dropped us into a French school. Now, why do you see a snowy scene in front of you? Here's why, here's why. When my brother and I woke up, the first day that we saw snowfall, we were super excited, super excited. Oh my gosh, we're gonna get a snow day. And my stepfather at the time looked at us in a very, with a puzzled expression and said, 
What's a snow day? They don't have snow days in Canada. You have to still go to school. And so we're like, what are you talking about? And so we got we got uh, clothed like uh, Luke Skywalker on half the ice planet and pushed out the front door saying, what is this place? And, you know, walking over snow banks. I know this is typically the time when people tell you that they walked uh, uphill both ways in the snow, but actually it was, it was pretty true uh, in, in my, um, uh, in my case. And the kicker was I would arrive at school and first period was PE and we had to throw ourselves into a frigid uh, swimming pool. Um, so that was uh, welcome to Canada, uh, was what that scene was. Now, because you have very long winters there, guess what we get to do? More indoor events. It was like COVID all the time, right? Where we're stuck uh, uh, indoors. And so you start reading comic books and, and other types of science fiction and things like that. And you start getting fascinated about what if, what would happen, what type of life am I going to have? You start playing all sorts of games and board games and video games and things like that. And you start you know, thinking of strategies for playing some of these games like Diplomacy and Risk and Stratego and SimCity and, and all sorts of different things. Um, and they help you know, you actually form opinions and, and how to deal with, with other people. Um, and then one summer, uh, my parents sent me over to a monastery. Why? To learn how to work on a farm. So that whole summer, I'm there in a monastery. And there I am by candlelight reading a book by Isaac Asimov. And I know the Apple uh, TV uh, Plus folks are about to do a movie about this. And the book was called Foundation. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind because I'm like, hold on, hold on a second. You're telling me I can use math to predict the future? That's fantastic. And then, and then I was reading about all of my childhood uh, heroes like Seymour Cray who invented the first supercomputers. I'm like, oh my gosh, math can predict the future. And all I have to do is pair it together with these uh, supercomputers. And so that's just started fascinating uh, me like uh, crazy and it led me to go where? Three, two, one, pause. All right, so it led me to go to Penn State as a nuclear engineering candidate, uh, because I was fascinated, hey, you know what, I'm gonna go somewhere where there's a nuclear reactor. You know, how fun would that be in our backyard uh, to play with? Uh, and so I ended up going there, but then I pivoted towards computer engineering because I was really fascinated that if I learned about computers, that computers would be a part of anything. It didn't matter if I was interested in healthcare or uh, if I was interested in finance, if I was interested in, in nuclear engineering or anything else, if I learned about computers, I literally could work on anything that, uh, that I wanted. And so here's a couple of examples that I did while an undergraduate. So by the way, I didn't, I didn't go to any football games or anything else. Instead, I was in a Navy lab. You know, they were building torpedoes, they were building submarines there, and I was working on building classified uh, computers for them that the rest of the scientists and engineers uh, used. It was called Applied AI, uh, I'm sorry, Applied uh, Research Lab. It was, it was super fun to work there, but of course I'm a dork. You know, I, I would uh, find that uh, fascinating. And then the next thing that we worked on that I was thrilled is uh, with JPL, NASA, Lockheed Martin, they allowed college students to do what? Build experiments that ended up going on uh, the space shuttle. My uh, experiment that I was uh, really uh, interested in on is how cosmic rays and radiation affect semiconductors. Basically, all the chips in your iPhones and your PlayStations and things like that, you know, as, as they leave the protective barrier of the magnetosphere, things start happening and, and little ones and zeros, uh, you know, go chaotic and they start flipping and, and they cause computer crashes. And it was to study, you know, the difference between uh, unprotected chips and ones uh, that were radiation hardened. That was super fun uh, for it to go up. Uh, years later, the president of uh, Penn State invited me and insisted that I go to a football game because I didn't do it as an undergraduate. I accepted the invitation because when you go to the president's box, they have a lot of ice cream uh, because Penn State is where Ben and Jerry's got their start making ice cream because of their agriculture school. So even with that, I can't do it exactly uh, the correct way. 
all right, so now what happened? You know, after undergraduate, I joined this company called IBM. I know for all of you, right, living in this really cool world of Facebooks and Googles and, 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 uh, and these style uh, companies and Apples, you know, IBM isn't really a, a company that you think of a lot. But back then, they were the cool kid uh, on the block, right? Because all these other companies that I just mentioned, most of them are internet based and that really didn't exist or it was just starting out. And so you can think of it as me starting my career there where things were really clunky and still character based. But by the end of my, uh, towards the end of my career there, you know, the internet was taking off and, and things were certainly a lot more approachable and there were new companies um, uh, that appeared. Now, the real reason, though, I have to say that I was really inspired to join there is because, again, they had um, an international presence. So I can see how people in many countries use technology, not just, uh, you know, folks in our country. And also because they had a systems view of, of, uh, of technologies, right, hardware and software uh, being put together with networking. And I thought that was important to see how the whole thing worked together instead of just the software or just the hardware. Now, while I was there, while I was there, I started really thinking about speech recognition and remember those dolphins? I'm like, hey, how am I gonna talk to those things, right? So I gotta think about this type of stuff. And so when I was looking at, at some of um, uh, the research that we were doing, I kept sending notes over to the speech recognition team. And, and they finally sent a terse reply that said, if you uh, stop sending us bloody emails, we'll let you lead the group. And so I ended up leading this, uh, this group focused on multimodal uh, research, which is fancy talk for audio and visual together. Like when you watch videos, it's audio and visual together. And I always thought that was, that was really cool and machine translation and things like that. And so then in 2005, I was quoted in this magazine, hey, um, a researcher, what's one of those things that are going to be possible? And I'm like, well, I don't wanna use a remote control anymore. I should be able to just to talk to my television. That's a form of AI, right? Let's, uh, let's talk to this thing. And I was really angry when they plopped this American 2025 uh, label on, on the top of the magazine. I almost flung that magazine across the room. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I have this thing already in the lab. I wanna bring it out to everybody uh, else. And so then I had another idea with the team. We were working on something, a secret project with Sony and Toshiba called the Cell Architecture, which you now know as the PlayStation 3. I know that seems like a, like a lifetime ago right now. All of you are excited for PlayStation 5s and then everybody has a 4 and now this is the 3 that I'm talking about. Well, I went to them and said, hey, can I put a speech recognition engine inside of that? And they all laughed. They all laughed. They said, you know what? Nobody's gonna put a microphone in their house. That's creepy, that's strange. Nobody wants a microphone in their house. And then so the following year I showed up and I said, hey, instead of putting the speech recognition on the device in the PlayStation, let me put it in the cloud. Let me put it in the cloud. That way uh, I can free up the budget on the, on, the, on the PlayStation so that you can have better games and I will actually give you higher accuracy. They laughed. They said, nobody's gonna ever use cloud-based uh, speech recognition. Nobody, uh, nobody wants that. And then finally in year three, I said, holy smokes, if we make this cloud-based speech recognition, not only can I, can I understand what people are saying, I can answer any question they have. Any question they have, why is the sky blue? A second later, it, it could be answered right on their PlayStation. By then they were laughing. It was, it was as if milk was shooting out of their noses. They're like, that's crazy talk. You can't answer every question that any human would ever want. So you know what? I left. I left. I, I did a startup. I got uh, investors to join the startup. And then I started my secret project. So here's what it was. I picked up a phone. I talked into it and it posted on Twitter. I was the first Twitter user in, in North and South Carolina. And I spoke, it's alive, right into Twitter. And you know what I spoke on? Baby Alexa, that's what we ended up building. And Baby Alexa used to be on these little flip phones and I would carry, her, carry them around, testing them in different places. I would be in the back of a cocktail party with my family members and they thought I was crazy talking to myself. And so this is in 2007 that I finally revealed that we were working on this AI assistant 
um, to the first ever TechCrunch uh, Disrupt Conference in, in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, so that was wild to show the world uh, what we were working on, but everybody was still scratching their heads saying, I don't get it. I'm not sure what this is. You know, how are people going to be uh, going to be using this? But you know who did get it? We started working in secret with Apple before they acquired Siri and they started experimenting about how this AI would start affecting people uh, in mobile. And um, we were also invited behind the scenes. There was a group in Hollywood of producers, of directors and writers of these uh, TV shows and, mo and movies that you may know. And they started saying, hey, start telling ab us about this AI thing in the future and how it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to roll out because that way we look smart and we, when we write our movies and things of that sort, it can look like we predicted the future. And at the same time, we can get the world ready for the things uh, that you're creating. And so that was um, uh, you know, really, uh, really fun to do that with them, very creative uh, people, and, and, and really being thoughtful about both preparing an audience for these technologies, and at the same time, giving feedback in terms of what the best experience uh, would be. Now, this thing you know, uh, you know um, was, um, you know, we tried getting it on Blackberries. Remember that? That's a company that nearly went out of business. And Palm Pilots, we tried putting them there. And then, like a Sopranos ending, we disappeared. We disappeared and nobody knew what happened. So many people started coming up to me and saying, what happened? You know, I was using your products. I downloaded it from the app store and then you just disappeared. Nobody knew what happened because we weren't allowed to say what happened. Why? because a new secret project uh, started being worked on. And now you know that as the Amazon Echo. So my R&D team at the time, they went in, uh, Google tried to acquire our company as well. And, and they worked many years in order to deliver this thing that, that now lives in, in uh, probably a hundred million kitchens answering weather, <laughs> sports, news, and, uh, and, uh, and triggering music and, and things of that sort. So the things that people were telling me that would be impossible all ended up happening. And guess what? Alexa was born in North Carolina. So that's, you know, when, when I look at what um, Charlotte is doing and what your school is doing as well, it's pretty special to know that one of the biggest things in, in artificial intelligence over the last 10 years on the whole planet was invented right here in North Carolina. That's not so bad. Right, um, you know, for uh, uh, for a nice um, uh, story here, and sure, IBM eventually caught up as well, and um, and and did the thing that I wanted them to do, and they won the Jeopardy match uh, with the, uh, their Watson uh, supercomputer that some of my uh, team members worked on uh, as well. So that's 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 the start of of uh, my journey. Now, what what ended up happening? So you had the proliferation of artificial intelligence in everybody's homes and all sorts of uh, uh, devices, right? You had um, HomePods and you had Google Assistants and Bixby speakers and all of these types of things that you would use at home for all of the things that you use them for. And I started getting worried, right? And I'm like, hmm, um, you know, what's the privacy implications of this? Can people do confidential work on the on these platforms? How would they start using them at work? You can't really use them the way uh, that they are today. Just like, honestly, the first um, uh, iPhone was a toy for the most part. It did media and entertainment, but it didn't do a lot of the things that people needed uh, to happen at work. And so there, it took a number of years before Apple built those um, things up. Even things that you consider gaming, Right, so a lot of technologies get invented for gaming, and then they eventually come to work. So the very same things that are inside of your PlayStations and your Xboxes, known as GPUs or graphical processing units, are the same things, the same chips that we use um, um, in industry to find drugs and vaccines and things like that for the coronavirus. It's the very same uh, processors, right? So I started thinking about what would it look like when if these things came uh, to work? And that's how I founded this company, uh, Prion. Now, Prion is a misspelling of the Prion protein. Um, it was the code name of the, of the engine that became Alexa. And so we decided to reuse it for the new company as an in-joke. Where did it come from? Well. In artificial intelligence, there's the concept of uh, reinforcement learning. This is where the AI 
eats its, its own output. I know it sounds like a very creepy Halloween, uh, ha um, a Halloween style thing. Ooh, you know, the creature is eating its, its own output. Um, and so uh, the way that um, mad cow disease happens is unfortunately the cows are eating um, uh, bits of uh, previous cows, right? That, that expired already, that passed away and that causes um, uh, the disease. And so our R&D team that don't actually get out all that often decided to name the engine prion after the protein because the, with machine learning, the AI was eating its own output. It's kind of sick, I know. Um, all right, so now I, I, I'm on the same journey again to say, all right, with natural language, with speaking, right? With, with all of this stuff, can I get access to everything, literally? The totality of content out there, um, for instance, you know, if you had to read the book Frankenstein, you know, RAI read the book Frankenstein uh, for you in a few seconds, right? You know, in a minute, you know, a book that I would typically take me all weekend to read, it could read um, in a minute, right? So that's fantastical. But, you know, there's still a lot of value in terms of who we are as people. And by the way, Amazon finally admitted that they acquired us. It took many years for them to admit that, th that the stuff came from, um, uh, you know, companies like ours. There's many startups that are acquired in secret, um, uh, you know, by Google, by Facebook, by Amazon, by Apple, that they uh, don't particularly ad uh, admit to until, until years later or uh, sometimes never. Um, and so that's the journey that we're on. So now... Let's, let's think about how these things are depicted in, um, in popular culture, right? And how do they intercept with ethics, right? Which is the topic um, that, that you all are keen on and you'll be working on you know, through the, the rest of the day. All right, so how is AI you know, typically viewed um, by the mass market, by, by normal people? Okay. Well, Isaac Asimov wrote this book called iRobot, right? And so it, it talked about, you know, as we build these robots and they start having a consciousness and sentience, what are some of the laws that, that these robots are going to be governed by? And those laws are basically the equivalent of AI ethics, right? That they can't do harm uh, to people and they, can, um, uh, they can't allow harm to, to happen, so on and so forth. Right, so there was the three laws of robotics, and funny enough, I mean, there, what's what's really wonderful about art uh, in general, right, and and especially this form of writing, is the fact that many AI practitioners, you know, people that are in the field, scientists and engineers and things like that, are still inspired by this thing that supposedly came out of fiction, right? They're still inspired by the rules that uh, Isaac Asimov was exploring in his, in his works uh, in iRobot. Then the next book that came out uh, by, um, uh, by Herbert here, Frank Herbert, was Dune, right? And so there's a movie coming up for, for that. Now, what's interesting about this, instead of saying, hey, you know, we're making robots and they're going to be doing smart things, but they're governed by laws, in, in this depiction of, of artificial intelligence, they basically said, oops, something really bad happened in the galaxy because of an AI and now AI is completely banned and smart computers are completely banned uh, from this world. So that's an, a, a negative depiction of AI uh, because they felt like it was absolutely uncontrollable and taboo and nobody should, uh, should study it. Then the next book that <laughs> came out with Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 and it had this infamous character, a very cold calculating AI called HAL. And HAL, if you actually look at the letters H-A-L-R-I-B-M, just shifted uh, over because IBM at that time was the dominant computer company on the, on the entire planet. And so this is an example of a malevolent force, you know, driving uh, uh, that story uh, line as well, very mysterious. Then, then you had things um, uh, like uh, Tron, um, you know, which is, um, you know, pretty interesting. This is where um, I think some of the characters got digitized and added into, uh, um, uh, into this uh, surreal, um, um, you know, cityscape inside of a computer where they had to do battle with uh, a master control program, which was pretty fun. 
Um, and then um, after that, that was in the 80s, right? So uh, when that came out uh, first by uh, Disney. And then there was um, a one called War Games Right, so War Games was uh, was pretty interesting. There was a, a supercomputer called Whopper that was in charge of of uh, of uh, America's defense network, uh, and it and it I think lost uh, its mind in some ways and started thinking that the game that it was playing with uh, with a, a teenager at home uh, through an old uh, style computer, probably similar to the to my first computer as well as they were first networked. Uh, through phone lines, it started thinking that that was a serious thing and not a game, and it and it started accelerating uh, the pace of antagonizing um, um, the national security uh, apparatus and potentially misfiring nuclear weapons. So that's kind of scary uh, to hear about while you're a kid still uh, during uh, the Cold War. And then, of course, we have uh, Skynet, right? That that um, you know is typically depicted as just the ultimate evil. It gets um, developed similar to the Whopper computer in war games. And of course, it just goes haywire and starts making uh, Terminators. Then you have more abstract themes like, all right, if these AIs are all powerful, then are we just uh, inside of this um, uh, matrix? <laughs> so are we just these little green characters inside of um, uh, these screens? And then, you know, what, it, what does it mean for us to be um, uh, conscious? Right, and so you have a lot of people thinking uh, through uh, that as well. I would think that's uh, that's pretty funny uh, as well. And then uh, more recently, you have um, you know two depictions of AI in, in uh, you know in these uh, Marvel uh, movies. You have the friendly Jarvis uh, that is helping Iron Man, but then you have uh, the malevolent uh, Ultron as well. That is an AI that says, you know what, uh, forget humanity. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose of you um, uh, of you is. And, and look, that was a lot <laughs> to go through. That was a lot to go through. Why can't it just be like Kit, right? A cool car that talks, helps fight crime. You know, this is similar to the Teslas that we now see driving up and down the roads and, and stuff like that. And I have to say, ultimately, when you see the majority of those uh, depictions of AI and ethics in, um, in uh, pop culture references, you know what the reality is, is you control it. You know, uh, AI doesn't control you, you're actually going to control it, right? You're gonna control the outcome of how this stuff plays out. But you have to be responsible with your use of technology, right? So no cyber bullying and things like that. You're also gonna have to have higher expectations, you know, from people like me that, that uh, build uh, tech companies to make sure that we are developing uh, these things, um, you know, to be helpful and not to harm people and not to hurt people uh, and, and things of that sort. So, you know, if you use social media, use it for good, right? Um, you, know, don't, you know, don't use it for negative purposes and really think about, you know, what happens when you share these things out. Now, when I say social media, you're like, what does that have to do with, with artificial intelligence? Well, when you're playing a TikTok, how do you think things get recommended to you to watch next when you're on YouTube? How do things get recommended to you to watch next? When you go to uh, Facebook, right? And you see these articles appearing in front of your news stream, maybe things from your friends and your family members and things of that sort. There's a recommendation algorithm that's putting that in front of you. When you open up uh, the amazon.com website and they're saying, hey, based on things that you've purchased in the back, past, here's some new games or some new books or some new music that you may uh, like as well. AI has been a hidden part of a lot of these consumer experiences already. And so there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how those algorithms work and, and how do they get leverage for, um, uh, you know, for good things. Like Facebook a long while ago, you know, got in trouble because they were A-B testing with students like you, where for half of you, they would show good news in your feed. And for the other half, they would show bad news. Well, what happens if you see a lot of bad news? You don't feel very good, uh, you know, that particular day. And so just because we have the power to recommend certain things or use AI for certain things, um, you know, we have to use it for good things. Like what? Like helping somebody like Brooke Ellison. You know, Brooke Ellison um, at 11 years old um, got into a car accident and became a quadriplegic, even though she was affected that way. 
thankfully she she um uh was growing up the, during the 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 time that we had more access to technology she reached out to me very thankful of 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 people in our field that worked on things like speech recognition because she was still able to graduate as the first handicapped person uh, to receive a diploma from the Ivy League. Now she's a, uh, she's a professor at Stony Brook University, a fantastic evangelist for, for the use of technologies to aid um, uh, people that are uh, handicapped. And, and look at all the fantastic things that she's been able to do uh, because she was able to backfill and have her abilities um, um, uh, essentially reinforced through the use of technology and artificial intelligence. That is a fantastic use of uh, technology for accessibility. Many of us actually, if you think about how we got started with some of these technologies, there's things we wanted to do. We actually wanted to help people that were deaf and blind, you know, to be able to still access uh, the internet. My team at IBM was the first one that ever made a speech enabled uh, web browser. And my chief scientist at the time that now works at Google was blind. Uh, and he said that his um, uh, seeing eye dog uh, was the only business style person that he actually liked. His name was Hubble. Um, and so that's a good use of, of, of technology. And so a lot of the negative uses of AI that you hear nowadays in many ways are unintended consequences. So anytime there's a new technology, you know, people like me are in, in some ways very innocently start adopting it and create uh, products for it. But once it hits a mass market, you start seeing some uh, some people figuring out some bad uses of some of these technologies, and that's normal for for absolutely anything that gets created. And then you need uh, the academic environment, or essentially schools, to give us guidance and 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 learn about the good uses of these technologies. Um, all of you as students and as consumers of these technologies, big tech companies, startups, and even government agencies that need to figure out the right way of policing some of these things to make sure that they're uh, mostly used uh, for good and for thoughtful things. And, and uh, I have to say, like, uh, like uh, one or two slides before, you're, you're controlling this outcome. You're literally control the outcome. And you know how you do it? First, figure out how it all works. Remember that picture that I had of the clockwork, right? And, and looking at my grandfather hunched over these, um, uh, these, uh, these things, it all looks complicated, right? But look at the things that you know today versus last year, versus the year before, versus the year before, versus the year before. Can you even imagine what you're going to know 10 years from now? I know it, it seems like, uh, you know, look, looking into a vision of Star Trek, right? It's, it's hard to even imagine that. But just day by day, read another book, play another game, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, attend a certain lecture, play, you know, invent things, write, write code, paint something, compose music, you know, this, a lot of these things are art and science blended together. I was always thrilled with speech recognition because it's the most natural way of interacting with a computer. And by the way, I'll tell you another secret. I was really good at speech recognition because I don't know how to type. I type with two fingers. If I had to write an essay like you would have to write, it would, you know, it would take me a week, uh, you know, to type uh, one page. It's the most ludicrous thing that I learned. I, I, I would have wished that I learned uh, way back uh, when. Um, and so the future, 10, 20, 30 years in the future is going to have these fantastical things that you're going to be creating called quantum computers that are going to be uh, uh, closer mimics of the way that our brains work. And so a lot of the things, right, whether it's discovering new, uh, new types of treatments and drugs and things like that, or new, new styles of games or new styles of AI that can help uh, 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 people, right? All, all new types of security, all of these things, new types of cars that can see uh, everywhere and react to changing conditions. It, it, it's gonna be amazing. Right now, they're still just like the old mainframes of, of a long time ago. These things are gonna be really, really big and they're gonna get bigger and they're gonna get bigger and they're gonna be so expensive, so expensive, so expensive. But in your lifetime, you know, then what's going to happen? It's just like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of a long time ago they'll eventually get, uh, get democratized. They'll get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you'll eventually have a quantum computer right in the palm of your hand doing all sorts of crazy things. 
or it'll be on your face, you know, on a set of glasses, or it'll be in a watch, uh, 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 you know, that you can carry anywhere. So, you know, that's that's the the future in front of us. And so, the use cases that are that this is going to drive, the sky's the limit. And, and you know what, if you're sitting there saying, hey, I eventually need to talk to my guidance counselor, I'm not sure the type of job that I'm going to have in the future, or whether I'm going to go into academia or start a startup or, or join a big company, um, or what type of job am I going to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I'm going to tell you a secret that, that, that uh, many uh, grownups won't tell you. We don't know what's coming. Not completely. We have hints of it especially some of us that work in tech. Remember when I wanted to talk to uh, the, um, my television 10 years before the Fire TV came out? So we have a pretty good grasp on what the world is going to look like in five or 10 years time. After that, things start getting hazy. This is where people like me start reading science fiction in order uh, to get um, inspired or comic books or, or games or media of, of various uh, form in order to start getting inspirations and start experimenting with certain things. The jobs that all of you will eventually end up with, or even you know, be a midpoint of their career, um, your career like me, or towards the tail end, they may not even exist yet. You know how I know that's true? Because my job didn't exist during my parents' time. My job didn't exist during my uh, grandparents' time or my great-grandparents' time. They had no idea. What is a social media coordinator <laughs> to, to one of our grandparents? That didn't exist until you had social media technologies, right? That, you know, that's just you know, one, one particular example. Who needs an AI person if there's no chips for us to run experiments on? We don't need that, right? Who needs a computer vision person without cameras, right? So certain technologies need to be developed um, and, and put out in market before um, you, know, you can do your things. Now. I think one of the, the most important things you can do though, in order to start your journey is start wrapping your minds around some internships. You know, there are certain internships you can do now as high school students. And I know it's a lot more challenging now because of the uh, pandemic, but you can do a lot of these virtually. And then later, there are certain types of internships that are STEM orientation. You don't have to, you know, focus on government service like I have uh, here, um, but, you know, just, you know, think through, you know, companies, the IBMs, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Apples, uh, the Amazons, um, you know, the, the different universities uh, that, uh, that, you be, uh, that you can be going to, the different government agencies, whether it's state level, local, or at the federal level, international uh, organizations, NGOs, nonprofits, there's so many different places you can go uh, with your skills. And what I would tell you, is be a polymath, be a Renaissance person, try everything, try art, try science, try these things, play an electric guitar, play a violin, play a, uh, play a flute, you know, do watercolor, sculpt, you know, do ballet, you know, do all of these things, volunteer, do all of these things because they actually help enrich and, and build your sense of intuition about where you would, you would go. And then be a voracious reader. You know, beyond many of the science fiction works that I talked about that inspired me as well, whether it's, you know, reading um, uh, Foundation by Candlelight, which was very surreal. Can you imagine, you know, being in a monastery, but, uh, you know, and, and them not having electricity, and I'm reading this book by Candlelight. Yes, there used to be physical books. It wasn't all Kindles and, and things like that back then. So I'm flipping through the pages, reading about this fantastical future of machines and mathematics predicting the future, which we now have, right? So we have many of these things that can predict uh, certain things. So beyond um, the science fiction, there's a great book called T-Minus AI by Michael Kanan, who um, is the chairperson of artificial intelligence at the US Air Force. It's a great book. It's like that old school uh, connections uh, show uh, that the BBC had uh, way back when. It shows you the origins of AI, literally from primordial ooze. I kid you not, Michael starts his book talking about goo and dinosaurs and things of that sort, and then connecting it to the modern day with all of this newfangled uh, AI and chips and software and things of that sort and how it's used, you know, in, in medicine and, and many other fields. 
another book is The Third Wave. This is by Steve Case. Um, he uh, founded uh, AOL way, way back uh, when, uh, which was the Google of its time. Um, and he talks about how the next wave is going to be uh, taking many traditional industries, whether it's agriculture, whether it's heavy industries, healthcare, and things like that, and bringing the technology uh, to them in order to reinvent themselves, make it more efficient, and, uh, and that people will be happier uh, in, in those jobs as well. And then lastly, as I already uh, mentioned before, Steve Welch wrote this book that we're all born entrepreneurs. I don't have a monopoly on, on making Alexis, right? Nobody does, right? And so when you actually read a, a book like that, it basically allows you to see that there's many, many different forms of entrepreneurship. Even in the, in the, in the educators that you are super lucky, by the way, to cross path with somebody like Charlotte, uh, for example, the fact that you know, you're even hearing this lecture right? And it's not a lecture. Hopefully it was a little bit more fun than that. But the fact that you're even hearing this means they're being entrepreneurial about the types of ideas that, that they're allowing you to uh, cross paths with, with. And the fact that they're listening to you about the things that are important to you and the things that you would want to hear, you know, for the rest of today as well. That's entrepreneurial. Just doing it, you know, you know, selling books as entrepreneur, working at Chick-fil-A as entrepreneurial, you know, volunteering somewhere and helping a nonprofit figure, figuring things out is entrepreneurial as well. But in any event, that's, um, uh, that's my story. Um, I'd love to open it up to uh, any questions uh, if, if, you, um, uh, if you have any. I do have the question. I do have the question. Okay. Oh, I'm a little bit uh, echoey. So uh, we have a question from um, Audrea Keys, and she asks, how did you keep going after all of those rejections when people were telling you your ideas wouldn't work and that no one would like it? Okay, that, that is an absolute great question. It gets to the foundation of what an on, entrepreneur does. Um, because I learned, because I grew, because I had great mentors around me, because um, I knew my subject matter right? And because I had a gut feeling, it's like a spidey sense, right? I had an intuition that even though really smart people were telling me, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to, uh, uh, to work. I remember having this meeting with an executive at Verizon and he, uh, who was supposedly really, really smart, um, um, you know, a, a, a about how this stuff would be used on phones. And he said, I don't get it. And he passed. He didn't invest in us. And I remember walking away uh, from that meeting with lead feet, practically like Frankenstein. I was probably, you know, uh, moving side to side and, and groaning uh, like, like Frankenstein did. And I finally shrugged it off by the time I got to my car and said, you know what? I see it. I'm sorry that he doesn't see it. I'm sorry, Guy Kawasaki, when I went and gave that talk uh, in Silicon Valley, didn't see it. I'm sorry, many investors didn't see it. Some people that I tried to hire didn't see it. You know, I just, you know, um, it just felt like the right thing that the world would need uh, would need this. And so that's why a lot of times when I meet people that are thinking about doing their own startups, um, including the guy who did the Carolina Reaper hot pepper, he crossed paths with me and he's like, I'm thinking about leaving my job at Wells Fargo. What do you think? I'm really passionate about hot peppers. What should I do? And I'm like, don't ask me, you know, is this something you feel like you have to do and contribute to the world, terrorizing them and putting hot peppers in their mouths? <laughs> go for it, go for it. Um, nobody else can plant that, that, that idea inside of you. And so if you, if you really are sure uh, about what you're doing, I think you do take a lots of input and you try to get smart about asking for feedback around you, but you just keep going. And you know what? You're gonna hear a lot of no's. I remember, um, uh, many years ago, I crossed paths with Will I Am, uh, the musician, and we were both laughing. We were both laughing about how many no's he received, right? And how nobody knew who he was, you know, playing music in the back of sleepy uh, bars or smoky bars or things of that sort. And he's like, I'm a quote unquote overnight sensation wearing, wearing my funny hats and, you know, doing all the things that I do. And yet, who was there and, and all the naysayers when I, when I was um, you know, doing the hard work. A lot of these things that you think are overnight successes with really successful people were exactly that, us hearing no's, lots and lots and lots and lots and a countless no's, hundreds, 
maybe thousands uh, of them, but we were sure about the things that we were creating, whether it's art or science. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. And that is, um, if you do have that great idea, what is the process like for getting investors for your product when no one seems to think it'll be feasible? Yeah, I think investors are earned, right? I think investors are earned. It's a lot of networking. The biggest thing that I can tell you is, is to find a mentor in somebody that's already done them. You know, I was, I was very fortunate that even in the last company that I was able to cross paths with um, uh, an angel investor uh, who was a, a senior executive at a, at a company, um, a, a wireless tower uh, company at the time. And now he's the CEO of, um, of, uh, of a carrier. And the fact that he's done it before, and he said, you know, do step A, step B, uh, A, B, and C. I didn't know those steps, right? And so the fact that I could be mentored by somebody that's already done it before, that's probably the most important thing I can tell you is find somebody that's done it before because somebody inevitably has done it before uh, you have. You bring the subject matter expertise in your new idea and they can help you fill in the blanks like, all right, what lawyers do I need? What accountants do I need? What engineers do I need? What scientists do I need? How do, how do I deal with patents and trademarks? And and, and cybersecurity, and how do I get customers and partners, all of these things. It sounds complicated, but guess what? Even when this company started, I was by myself, one person, and then I hired a lawyer, and then I hired an accountant, and then, and then, uh, um, and then these fantastic engineers joined us on, on our journey as well. And now, you know, it's a much bigger company with, with many fantastic people working here, but it really sometimes just starts with one person. Thank you for being here today, Igor. We've really appreciated you. I hear the virtual applause coming all around. Um, and if someone wanted to um, be in touch, um, is there a way that they should do that? Yeah, they can find me on Twitter or, or uh, LinkedIn. Uh, happy to talk to anybody and point them in the right direction.